The Honourable Member for Halifax, Shibukto. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are um, a number of things that call out to be said in response to uh, these amendments to the Interim Residential Rental Increase Cap Act. I think the first thing that calls out to be said in response to this extension of the rent cap is congratulations. Uh, <laughs> congratulations yeah. first to all of those people who have been taking petitions door-to-door uh, -door for rent control through the cold of the winter and have been doing this since last December. Congratulations to them. And congratulations to all those people who have enthusiastically signed that rent control petition. Uh, sometimes signing it uh, despite a uh, a sense of, of fear of potential repercussion if their landlord might see their name uh, on that petition. Sometimes signing the petition uh, despite having spoken about having some uh, nervousness, which is an understandable nervousness and not rare amongst newcomers, that their signature might have some potential negative impact on their long-term aspirations about their immigration status, but who signed the petition just the same. Congratulations to them. Congratulations to all the people who, who took the petition and had their picture taken uh, while they were signing it and then they shared that with all of their networks and, and then who invited their roommates to come to the door and sign it too and, uh, and who uh, shared it with their, their networks and their families and, and asked everyone to sign. Congratulations to them all. I think we ought to also say, as the rent cap gets extended for two years, congratulations to ACORN. Mm. Congratulations to ACORN, because if it were not for ACORN's tenants' rights struggles in 2019 and 2020, I am persuaded there would not be a rent cap today to be extended in the first place. I think we should say congratulations to Dalhousie Mutual Aid, who protested here for permanent rent control a week ago uh, today. And congratulations. Uh, to Dalhousie Legal Aid and, and Nova Scotia Legal Aid, who have steadfastly, uh, over the last two and a half years of the rent cap and the period that led up to it originally, who have steadfastly told the truth in those organizations about residential rents in Nova Scotia. Uh, and congratulations, I want to say, too, to all the journalists who have had the professional sound judgment to go to Nova Scotia Legal Aid and Dalhousie Legal Aid and get the truth about the rental situation. I should say, while we're speaking about Dalhousie Legal Aid, while we're assembled here uh, debating this evening the uh, amendments to the rent cap, the annual general meeting is being held uh, of Dalhousie Legal Aid. Uh, the theme of the annual meeting of Dalhousie Legal Aid tonight is eviction prevention in Halifax. Mm. And uh, a panel discussion is being held at this moment uh, with Joanne Hussey, Eric Johnson, Max Chauvin, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are one or two others. Uh, I think it would have been instructive for every member of the government to be there. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to Dalhousie Legal Aid and congratulations to all the people uh, who, who wrote to their MLAs about their concern uh, on this subject, uh, who wrote up about their personal situations of uh, unconscionable, very, very difficult uh, rent increases, and, and who wrote, as we have read in so many of those emails, uh, about how uh, I've never written an MLA before. This is not the kind of thing I do. Uh, but this has been my experience in my household, and this is a very difficult situation, and who, for the first time in their lives, often uh, wrote about the need uh, for uh, rent protect, cap protection uh, to their MLAs. And, and congratulations also to all of those uh, who followed that up by sending an email to the Premier's office indicating that neither they nor anyone in their immediate or extended family would ever vote Conservative again as long as any of them lived if the reg unregulated market were allowed to send rents to Nova Scotia after December 2023. Congratulations to them. So congratulations to all of them, because all of these uh, forces together in civil society uh, have done quite a thing. They, they have pressured a government which declared itself unequivocally uh, opposed uh, to rent control, uh, uh, to bring in a rent cap with this act, to bring in a rent cap that will uh, extend beyond the July 
25 conclusion of the mandate of the present government. So congratulations. So I think that's the first thing uh, that should be said about this bill. The second thing, however, uh, which should be said is that, again, as with the rent cap of 2020 and then uh, in 2021, once more, we're in a position in Nova Scotia where the government's response to the outcry of the people of the province has fallen short of the permanent, effective, comprehensive rent control, which is experienced by a majority of people in our country and which is what is required for the people of Nova Scotia. Now, I, I want to speak about some of the differences between the Conservatives' rent cap and the rent control, which is outlined in our Rental Fairness and Affordability Act, the rent control which is uh, supported and put forward uh, by the NDP. There are many, many differences between uh, the temporary rent cap and permanent effective comprehensive rent control. But the one that is most relevant to this discussion, and the one that I think is very important, is that the Conservatives' rent cap applies only to tenancies. Uh, my colleague spoke about this a few moments ago. The Conservatives' rent cap applies only to tenancies, whereas in a system of permanent rent control, the regulation applies uh, uh, to the actual rental unit rather than to uh, the tenancy, which may come and go. And this is a very important difference, uh, whether or not uh, the, uh, uh, the regulation applies to the tenancy or to the unit. Because if the regulation applies to the tenancy and not the unit, which is the case with this rent cap, landlords are in fact always incentivized to be finding new tenants. Um, since as soon as the tenancy changes hands, the cap does not apply. That is the great weakness and the great difficulty of applying the regulation only uh, to the tenancy and not to the unit itself. Um, with comprehensive, effective, permanent rent control, as we in the NDP uh, are advocating, the regulation uh, applies to the unit, not to the tendency. Uh, the regulated unit rent would be capped regardless of whether there was a continuous tenant for 25 years or whether there was a whole parade of new tenants. And the result uh, of that uh, cap of regulation applying uh, to the unit rather than to the tenant is, is, is that changing tenants would financially, uh, from the landlord's point of view, be neither here nor there because the rent would going to be capped regardless. So this is a very important distinction. With rent regulation by the tenancy, as we have it with this rent cap, uh, landlords are always incentivized to deal with their own financial pressures, which we will certainly acknowledge are many in the case of the present inflationary environment. Landlords are incentivized with the kind of system that the government is operating with uh, to, to find some form, often any kind of form, to get the tenants out the door. Um, so this can take many different forms of uh, how uh, landlords act on this incentive uh, to uh, renew the tenancy and thereby get around the rent cap. It takes the form sometimes of just a kind of a generalized uh, non-responsiveness to legitimate uh, maintenance concerns. Uh, sometimes it just takes the form of a poor attitude, a kind of a, an uncalled for, surly, miserable attitude uh, uh, that uh, hasn't got any cause for it, any, any, anything in, that anything the tenants uh, uh, might have done. Um, sometimes it takes the form of just kind of low-grade chronic harassment of the tenants. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very commonly, yeah. the form it takes is the invented requirement for renovations at such a level as will require the tenants to move, and thus the word renovation in the last couple of years has entered into our language. Uh, but. The most common form that this pressure on the landlords to give to deal with their financial pressures by renewing the tenancy and thereby get around the rent cap, the, the, most, the most common form that this takes uh, is the landlord's use of fixed term leases. That is, taking a, a, a lease that has a defined uh, end date, usually a year, and at the, which at the conclusion of that time the landlord can choose to renew or not renew for any reason or for no reason, and, and the, as a consequence, under 
undermining any vestige of the protection of security of tenure uh, for the tenant. That is the great difficulty of uh, rent control, which applies uh, to the tenancy rather than to the unit. Um, this, therefore, brings me to the third thing that I think should be said about this rent cap extension cap, uh, act. No rent cap, Speaker, can work. No rent cap can provide the protections to tenants that the government puts itself forward here as providing unless it plugs the loophole that landlords in enormous numbers are using today to get around the rent cap in fixed term leases. Well, I want to be as clear as possible here. We in the NDP are not calling for the end of fixed-term leases. Uh, we understand very clearly, the point is obvious, the, the normal role that fixed-term leases have, where one person for a set period has a place that they want to rent while the place is available and, and vacant. Uh, what we're calling for, rather, is a system where fixed-term leases cannot simply be used as they are today holus bolus in Nova Scotia to evict tenants, to jack up rent, to skirt the protections of the rent cap. It makes every sense that other jurisdictions that have permanent rent control in fact do this. They plug this loophole uh, so the rent control will be effective. They do this with automatic uh, default position rollovers of leases. Because if you don't do this, you end up in the situation that we're in exactly now in Nova Scotia, where the only leases landlords make available to, to be signed to a great extent are fixed term leases. Uh, so I, I think the public should be aware of how the minister responsible for residential tenancies looks on this crucial problem. The minister was very clear, repeatedly, in fact, clear, in his comments to media in introducing the bill that is before us this evening, and in his comments uh, later uh, that day to questions concerning fixed-term leases, that his view is that when he speaks of the uh, uh, of the use of fixed-term leases for purposes other than those for which they're intended, he thinks of this as a, 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 an occasional abuse. There's something that landlords are doing uh, here and there, a, a few uh, bad apples that are causing problems. This is an, an odd circumstance uh, 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 which he speaks about, but uh, as something as though it were just taking place uh, here and there. But this, McSpeaker, this is absolutely not the case. And it does not accord with anybody's real experience of the real current rental market in Nova Scotia. Yeah. In the real world rental market today in Nova Scotia, virtually all the leases that landlords are making available are fixed term leases. I would be willing to bet the minister anything that he would care to bet me, that if he asked his staff tomorrow afternoon to go on Kijiji or go on Facebook Marketplace and find out the terms on which the first 10 apartments that they looked for were, were being offered, I would be willing to bet he would find uh, that at least eight or nine and very possibly 10 of those uh, would be fixed term leases and that would be all that would be available to that Kijiji Facebook Marketplace inquiring inquiry. And it is, it is therefore, I think, not a good thing that the minister responsible for residential tenancies is at such an apparent distance from the realities of the rental market uh, to such an extent that he is apparently unaware of the across-the-board ubiquitousness of fixed-term leases today in Halifax and in Nova Scotia. So the minister has also made uh, clear his opinion, uh, I think I'm representing it uh, uh, squarely and honestly, that since in his view it is the financial pressures of the 2% rent cap that have led in, in, his, uh, in his view to the abuse of fixed term leases, that therefore as he reads the situation, uh, a 5% rent cap is going to alleviate these pressures and that's going to lead to the decline of these fixed term lease abuses. I, that is the reasoning the minister has offered. I think that's a clear representation of it. But I think we might well ask, what is the evidence for this analysis? Yeah. What is, what is the evidence on the basis of which the minister I I is holding this view on behalf of the government? Or, or maybe we'd better not ask the question, because I don't think there is any evidence uh, for this analysis. Uh, 
Uh, I think that this is not, in fact, an analysis at all. This is rather a vague la-la hope uh, and aspiration, uh, which is blissfully unaware of the fact that landlords in Nova Scotia today provide every evidence of having received the message from one another very clearly in 2023, get the tenants into fixed term leases and you'll be able to get around the rent cap when at the end of the, end of the lease you don't renew it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think a dose of the real is in order. And to that purpose, I'd like to read an email which I received uh, on March 12th from a constituent in Halifax, Shabakto named Robin McIntosh. Robin has given me permission uh, to quote her letter uh, in this debate this evening. She writes this, uh, dear Mr. Burrell, member of the assembly, Halifax, Shabakto. I love living in Halifax. As a small town islander, PEI, not Newfoundland, moving here in 2008 for school was an adventure and one that I'm happy to say I'm still experiencing since deciding to stay after graduating. Since landing in Halifax, I always wanted to live in a neighborhood that meant something to me. It made me feel like I was home and I'm happy to say I found that. This neighborhood is a magical place. From the kids that sell lemonade on Windsor Street in the heat of the summer, to the cultural excitement that we see at the Lebanese Fest, to the early morning breakfast at the Ardmore, and the families that come together for evening walks through the tree-lined neighborhoods we all call home. This community is vibrant, accepting, and made up of people that love living here. I'm sad to say that I now have to leave this neighborhood. Not because I want to, but because like so many others in Halifax, the housing crisis has reached an unprecedented level. I signed a fixed-term lease with a rental company that owns several properties in the city, predominantly in the north and west ends of the city. They have decided to not renew my lease after six years. As I have been an ideal tenant, this came as quite a surprise until I saw my own unit posted online with a rental increase of $947 a month. With the current rent cap, my landlord could not raise my rent more than 2%. However, if they refuse to renew my lease, they can increase the rent any price they wish. My unit, which I pay $12.48 per month for, is now posted online for $2,195 a month. This landlord is doing this to entire buildings of people around the city in order to avoid the rent cap with properties on Windsor. Yeah. Almond, Jubilee, Oxford, Shirley, Columbus, Tobin, all have seen exponential increases in rent this year and tenants being forced to leave at the end of their term so the rent cap can be avoided. Other provinces have legislation in place that does not allow this loophole to exist, notably British Columbia. I don't want to leave this neighborhood. I don't want to leave this city, but we are being priced out. I have a fantastic job. I survived graduate school. I'd like to begin my PhD, but that is seeming more and more impossible if I stay in Halifax, our hands are tied. We have no rights, no legal recourse. We need to rely on the government to take on these issues and help the people who make up the very fabric of the communities we live in. Mr. Speaker, Matt Mick Speaker, I, I, I have a file of such correspondence and so do each of my colleagues. Um, I find it distressing and alarming that the minister responsible on behalf of the people of Nova Scotia for these matters has not taken in the core truth that is being conveyed here, namely that a rent cap cannot provide the protections it is presented as providing unless the fixed term lease loophole, loophole that circumvents it is cut off. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If 